Hello, my dear students. I'm Dr. Vaishali Bharande. This lecture is a part of my embryology lecture series titled as Fertilization Part 1. So what is fertilization? Let's try and define it. It's a fusion of two mature germ cells. Which germ cells? A oocyte from the mother and a spermatozoon from the father to form a single cell the zygote. It's a very simple definition of fertilization. Where does it occur normally? The site for fertilization normally should be the ampulla of fallopian tube. And when does it occur? It occurs about 24 to 48 hours from the ovulation. So these are some basics of fertilization to bring you into the topic. So let's take a look. Here's a female. She is producing the secondary oocyte. Here's a male. He is producing the sperms. Both the oocyte and the sperm travel to the ampullo fallopian tube where the sperm penetrates the secondary oocyte and finally there is production of an embryo. This whole process is fertilization which is influenced by a number of factors such as does the mother go through oogenesis? Is she producing an oocyte? Same for spermatogenesis. If there is spermatogenesis, are the sperms being produced or not? Are they allowed to travel to the uh, ampullo fallopian tube? Is the secondary oocyte allowed to travel to the ampullo fallopian tube? So these are oocyte transport, sperm transport. These are factors which affect fertilization. Suppose the sperms are not allowed to reach the ampullo fallopian tube. For example, a simple thing like using a condom. So, in this case, the sperms are not being allowed to reach the ampullo fallopian tube. What is affected? Fertilization is affected. Okay, so each of these processes matter. Finally, are do they fuse together? The sperms may be there right next to the oocyte. Do the two fuse together? Only on fusion will there be fertilization. So, all these are factors affecting fertilization. And therefore, fertilization process is being studied as oogenesis, spermatogenesis, which are separate lectures and have been uploaded as separate lectures. And fertilization has been divided into three lectures, part 1, 2, 3. In part 1, I will be talking about transport of gametes from the male testes to the ampulla, from the ovary to the ampulla or fallopian tube, that is part 1. Part 2 is when they meet and they fuse and there is fertilization. And part 3 is the effects of fertilization and that's when we'll be discussing the applied anatomy. Okay, so let's dive in for the, into fertilization part 1. That is transport of the gametes from individual parents to the ampulla or fallopian tube. Let's begin students. Here's the father or the male producing the sperms which have reached the ampulla or fallopian tube. Here's the secondary oocyte which is also reaching the ampulla or fallopian tube. Thus, the whole process is having two parts, sperm transport, oocyte transport. So our lecture therefore gets divided into sperm transport and oocyte transport. So, why do we study these two movements? Simple, like I said, if there is no sperm transport, there is no fertilization. If there is no oocyte transport, again there is no natural fertilization. Let's talk about sperm transport then. As you are well aware, this means traveling from the testes in the male to the ampulla in the fallopian tube of the female. Okay, so what happens? Always I say, look at pictures. I have given you a lot of theory in this lecture, which where I expect you to pause the video and read. But I won't be teaching it. You pause the video and read. I'll be teaching on images because I don't believe in reading PowerPoint students. You can use the theory for writing your answers. Right. So come take a look. Here's the testes which has started to produce the sperms. They travel through the vas deferens to the male urethra. As they reach the male urethra, the seminal vesicles and the prostate release their own secretions into the uh, semen forming a bulk of semen which is about 2 to 6 ml which is then released into the female vagina. 
Okay, so this is how sperms produced in the testes are finally reaching the female vagina. What is it that the seminal vesicles and the uh, prostate are adding? The seminal vesicle is adding something called fructose. So fructose will give energy to the sperms to move. Seminal vesicle is also adding something called vesiculase. I'll tell you what is the use of it. Let's just remember it's adding something called vesiculase. Uh, the semen also contains prostaglandins. So what happens? The prostaglandins cause the uterine musculature to contract and help in the movement of the sperms. So think what we've learned. We've learned that testes is producing the sperms which are traveling through the vast difference, receiving nourishment from seminal vesicles and prostate and also bulbo-urethral glands. This, these sperms in the bulk of semen of about 2 to 6 ml are released into the female vagina. Okay, This contains about 200 to 600 million sperms. Okay? And finally, they are reaching into the interior of the vagina where because of enzyme vesiculase, the whole semen coagulates. What does it do? It coagulates. Why should it coagulate? Because otherwise it would flow out. So the sperms would have less chance of entering in into the uterus. So to prevent the backflow of sperm, the whole semen coagulates there. Okay, this is called as a vaginal plug. Now what do the sperms do? They are in the vaginal plug. They begin to enter into the cervix. As they enter in the cervix, they get stored in the cervical mucosa. Why are they being stored, ma'am? They all need to go to the ampulla quickly. No, this is a very good strategy. They are released now in batches. They are not allowed to go in mass. It's a war strategy. Okay. So you have got uh, students going in small batches. Okay. Or sperms going in small batches towards the ampulla. Okay. You are not allowed to storm the bastion at the, all at the same time. You will probably kill each other in the uh, bargain. So they go in batches. Okay. Meanwhile, because of the coital reflex, the uterus is contracting with the release of oxytocin. This is further helping the sperms to move towards the ampulla. The Each sperm is having its own tail. The lashing movements of the tail are crucial in the movements of the sperm. And finally, the secondary oocyte which is being released in the ovulation releases chemoattractants. That by itself stimulate the sperm, giving them direction to move towards the secondary oocyte. So all these factors cause the sperms to transport themselves to the ampulla fallopian tube. Let's revise once. So as you can see, sperms are produced in the testes. They travel through the vast difference. They reach the male urethra. Here they receive secretions from seminal vesicles, prostate and bulbourethral glands. And finally, 200 to 600 million sperms are released in the female vagina. The semen coagulates in the form of vaginal plug in the interior of vagina. Sperms now begin to travel through the cervix where they are stored in the cervical mucosa, from where they are released in batches, trying their best to reach the ampulla fallopian tube. The, the contraction of the uterus because of release of oxytocin aids in the movement of sperms. So also do the, does the tail of the sperm help in the forward movement. The chemoattractants released by the oocyte finally give direction to the sperm to move towards that ampulla of fallopian tube. This is how sperms transport themselves from the male testes to the ampulla of fallopian tube. But a lot of factors will influence the fertilization. Sperms may go, but there will be other factors which will influence. For example, how motile is the sperm? How many sperms are there per ml? What is the morphology? What is the viability of the sperm? All these will affect the process of fertilization. <clears throat> Let's understand for a minute. Sperms are almost immotile in the male genital tract. A little bit of motility may be acquired through the epididymis. <coughs> right. <coughs> they can live for long periods of time in the epididymis and vast difference. Now you are wondering, ma'am, why are you giving us so much information? 
Oh my God, this is very important, students. I'll tell you why. This is interesting. Listen to it. So see what happens. Supposing there is a male who has undergone vasectomy. Take a look at this image. As you can see, this portion of the vas difference has been cut and tied off. But what was my prior sentence? Sperms can stay in vas difference for long periods of time. So although the vas difference has been cut, there may be sperm still in the distal segment of the vas difference. And after an unprotected intercourse, the, the female might still find herself pregnant. And the male is going to say that I have undergone vasectomy. How come you conceived? I think he, his question is valid. And she is going to have no answer to it. Whereas there is going to be a definite suspicion on her. So the fact remains that whenever vasectomy is done, it is advisable to tell the uh, couple involved to have protected intercourse till a couple of months on when most of the sperms present in the vast difference are likely to be voided out. Now, these are things that matter because this is real life. We are not studying just for the theory of it. We are preparing ourselves for what questions might be asked by involved parties. So vasectomy to be studied as what is vasectomy? Why to have protected intercourse even after vasectomy? Can vasectomy, can the vas difference be recanalized in case the uh, father, if the male wants to again have progeny? What are the fertility often or options following vasectomy? These are all things that you must consider whenever you are studying. Okay, don't look at it just like theory. Look at it like real life. Then you will find yourself interested in knowing answers to these questions. Continuing with our discussion, sperms can move at a speed of about 2 to 3 millimeters per minute. Their, P, their movement is very much dependent upon the pH of the environment. So in the acidic vagina, their movement is slow. In the alkaline uterus, their movements are way faster. How much time does the sperm take to reach the uterine tube? It takes about 30 to 70 minutes. Of course, there are a lot of books giving different data, but this is from the most reliable source. How long do sperms remain motile? Actually, they remain motile for long periods. Uh, see, think of the fact that sperms are being um, donated and stored, frozen. So you can understand that the motility is pretty long. But uh, they need to be uh, potent for 24 to 48 hours only post ovulation. So note that women can conceive a child artificially using a semen which was stored in frozen state for several years. So that's how long they can remain motile. Right. So although 100 million sperms per ml are released in the vagina, that means around 200 to 600 million sperms are released in the vagina, barely 300 to 500 sperms actually make it to the ampullar fallopian tube. Can you see the ratio students? So this is probably a natural selection method by nature so that only the most uh, perfect sperms, most capable sperms are allowed to actually fertilize the oocyte. Right. So, sperms can be classified therefore based on their motility as rapidly progressive, slowly progressive, non-progressive and immotile. My suggestion is you go to this, the link for this is given in description section. Go and take a look at this video. It's very interesting. You can actually see sperms, you can see when they are immotile, you can see when they are sluggish. It's an education by itself. My strong suggestion is take a look at this video. It will be educational for you. Right. And the motility is affected by things like immotile cilia syndrome, abnormal structural sperm, or maybe even some drugs that the person is taking could affect motility of the sperm and therefore fertility itself. Right. Based on motility, you have a condition called asthenozoospermia when majority of the sperms are immotile. Can you see these? The tail is straight, they are immotile, while very few are actually motile. So, if when most of the sperms are immotile, you call the condition as asthenozoospermia. WHO has come up with some values for analysis of sperms. These are the values. You can take a look at your leisure. 
When there are greater than 20 million sperms per ml of semen, you call it as normozoospermia. When there are less than that, okay, or even up to 5 million sperms per ml, you call them as oligozoospermia. What is the meaning of oligo? Scanty, few. So, take a look at this now. You can see that there are very few sperms, in which case you call this as oligozoospermia. When the sperms are abnormal in their structure, a sperm may have elongated head, large head, tiny head, double head. I think a uh, wiki donor was an education to all of us, isn't it, about what a sperm can be. Okay, but beyond wiki donor, let's learn a little bit more. There can be a double tailed sperm, there can be a sperm with an abnormal middle piece and so on. All these sperms are together categorized as teratozoospermia when large portion of the sperms are morphologically abnormal. Right. Then there is something, a mixture of all of this. Oligo, astheno, teratozoospermia. Oligo is scanty. Astheno is lazy. Terato is abnormal. When all these are coupled together, then you have what is called oligo, astheno, teratozoospermia. Then there is something called azoospermia, no sperm, as you can see here. And then based on viability, you can say there is something called necrozoospermia. That means the most of the sperms there are non-viable. All these are terms you need to know. Oligo, scanty, astheno, weak, terato, abnormal, oligo, astheno, terato, all three. Azo, absent, necrozo, non-viable. So, it's up to you to learn of these terms. They are very much part of any infertility study. So, with this, we have done certain discussion on sperm transport, abnormalities of sperm, semen analysis and so on. I am kind of preparing you for the rest of the two lectures as well. Let's talk about oocyte transport. Oocyte is produced by the ovary. Okay, It is picked up by the ciliary beads of the uterine tube which is going and covering the ovary. Parallelly, muscle contraction is helping in pulling up the oocyte to reach the ampulla of fallopian tube, right? So, again, there can be people who do tubectomy. How does it affect oocyte transport? It affects fertilization because the oocyte reaches the ampulla but sperms don't. So, tubectomy again prevents fertilization by preventing oocyte transport or sperm transport. Sperm transport. Oocyte reaches the ampulla of fallopian tube. Sperms don't. Right. So, what did we do today? We saw that the male produced sperms which reached the ampulla of fallopian tube through the process of sperm transport. We discussed factors influencing sperm transport normal sperm count as per WHO and abnormalities of sperms. Then we discussed how the female produces second oocyte which also reaches the ampulla of fallopian tube and we just briefly touched on tubectomy. Now, both the select sperm and the second oocyte have reached the ampulla of fallopian tube. Do they fuse? Do they bring about fertilization? That is the next lecture, fertilization part 2 contact and fusion of gametes. Okay, This will be followed by a lecture on effects of fertilization and related applied anatomy. I strongly suggest you watch both of these lectures. Also, the link for these lectures is given in the description section. Students, if you have liked this lecture, do like and subscribe. Please do share your comments about the lectures. It will help me to understand if I am making a difference in your education. Thank you students. I loved taking this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it too. See you across the screen in lecture 2 on fertilization.